I want to play a clip for you that's been viewed more than 26 million times. If anything kills over 10 million people in the next few decades, it's most likely to be a highly infectious virus rather than a war. Not missiles, but microbes. That was Bill Gates back in 2015, five years ago, warning about precisely the kind of threat we're all facing right now. Since then, Gates has been doing everything he can to prevent a pandemic. Two months ago, the Gates Foundation committed $100 million to fight the coronavirus. Earlier, I sat down with Bill Gates to discuss what we need to do now. Bill, it took four months to reach half a million cases around the world and just seven days to add another half million cases. So how dangerous, how fearsome is this virus? And how do you see this epidemic playing out in the U.S.? Well, this is a, a nightmare scenario because human-to-human uh, -human transmissible respiratory viruses can grow exponentially. And, you know, if we had kept on uh, going to work, traveling like we were, you know, that curve would never bend until you had uh, the majority of the people infected and then uh, a massive number seeking hospital care and, and lots and lots of deaths. So, you know, we've had to use quarantine, which is a, you know, old uh, thing back from the, the days of the plague, as our primary tool. Uh, fortunately, if we use that well enough, we should, uh, towards the end of this month, start to see those numbers level off. And then if we continue countrywide uh, and we're testing the right people to understand what's going on, which uh, is not the case yet, those numbers will start to go down. And then we can look at some degree of opening back up. President Trump's top health advisors are talking about somewhere between 100 and 240,000 deaths over the next two months. Does that sound about right to you in terms of the lethality and the length of the outbreak here in the U.S.? Well, if we do the um, social distancing properly, we should be able to get out of this uh, with a death number well short of that. It's very important that those numbers are out there because a lot of people are still thinking, hey, isn't life normal? Not waking up every day to a completely new reality. And so I was very glad that those models are out there. Uh, you know, Dr. Fauci is doing a very good job of saying the numbers are what count here. And, you know, the various models that we, Imperial University, do show uh, that without this dramatic behavior change, you could even get worse than that. But I do think uh, if we get the testing fixed, we get all 50 states involved, uh, we'll be below that. Of course, we'll pay a huge economic price in order to achieve that. You say that if we do everything right now in terms of testing and shutting the country down, that we should have only one wave of this virus. Why are you so confident? Because a lot of people aren't so sure that we're not going to have a recurrence when we get another flu season next fall. Well, we don't know how seasonal this virus is. Uh, you know, it'd probably be good for the Northern Hemisphere if the force of infection goes down as we get into spring and summer, you know, and give us some time to get both the drugs and advance uh, the vaccine. It's, it, it is fair to say things won't go back to truly normal until we have a vaccine that we've gotten out to basically the entire world. And so, you know, the best people at the foundation uh, who are all about uh, high volume vaccines, you know, are working with many manufacturers uh, not only on the safety and efficacy, but getting that uh, billions of dose capacity. Uh, and so, like China, there'll be a partial opening up, uh, which some jobs will resume, school will resume, but we'll have to be very, very careful not to have the rebound uh, until the vaccine comes. Now, you talk about the foundation. All the way back on February 5th, the Gates Foundation committed $100 million to fight this virus. 
But you point out the fact that the, our government, like a lot of other governments, was very slow to respond. Really, it, another two months we might have lost. How much did that cost us in terms of the spread of this disease, that, that one or two months that we lost? Well, there are countries like Taiwan who were exemplary, uh, saw the problem and really got the testing, community-wide testing uh, done very well. They prioritized who got tested. And so they won't either have the disease burden or the economic uh, effect uh, that other countries will have. Uh, China, by late January, had taken it seriously. And so, uh, you know, their ability to get the cases to come down has been dramatic. South Korea has done that. And so there are lessons uh, that we're learning from uh, and, you know, we're all in this together. Uh, we've got to get rid of coronavirus from the entire world. Uh, you know, the U.S., we can see how tough it is here. Uh, likely, it'll be even worse in the developing countries who as yet don't have nearly as many cases. How do you think the federal and state governments are responding now? And would you prefer to see it all being handled on a national level, whether it's stay-at-home orders or testing or the supply chain? Would you prefer to see this all being handled on a national centralized level rather than state by state? Well, when you have finite resources, you need to allocate them to where there's the most need. Certainly, the because people move around the country, we have to have the shutdown or else you'll have exponential growth that will spread back into other parts of the country. In terms of testing, uh, people have gotten confused and think it's just about numbers. The key is that you have a response to the test in less than 24 hours and that you're prioritizing the right people. And so although the numbers are going up, we're not yet focusing in on that you know, medical personnel or somebody who's keeping the electric network or the food distribution working and being able to say if somebody tests positive, very quickly test their contacts. And so, uh, you know, I do think, uh, you know, that allocation, uh, prioritization of testing will be a key tactic for us to get uh, into good shape. And that needs to be done at a national level, not a state level? That's right. I mean, you have some states that it just happens the number of PCR machines in that state are very few, and you wouldn't think, hey, that's the way this, this should be done. Also, the outbreak, uh, you know, is bigger in, in some areas, and so, therefore, that drives the, uh, the testing demand, likewise, the ventilator uh, demand. I mean, this is all very ad hoc because we never did a full-blown simulation. There were a few, <clears throat> a few things done. But it's not like war, where we do war games all the time. We have people standing by, resources standing by in a dramatic level. Uh, you know, we're kind of figuring this out as we go, which, you know, people are rising to the occasion. And, you know, it's fantastic to see that. Uh, but, uh, you know, every day we can see that case number is still going up. When you gave that famous TED Talk five years ago, you laid out a lot of the things that we're starting to do now, like research and development on new tests and R&D on vaccines. But so many countries around the world, including the U.S. back in 2015, largely ignored your warnings. Why do you think that was? <clears throat> well, there's, it's hard to put money into something where you don't know if it's going to happen. We do for fires because, you know, we've seen that over time. We do for war, in fact, you know, $600 billion a year. In that case, what would have been required, you know, is nothing like that. Um, you know, the ability to make a test super quickly, the ability to, to know how a library of drugs that would work for this, ability to have the vaccine very quickly. I am sure after this, which is just such a gigantic uh, impact, that we will put that money in. But between 2015 and 2020, uh, less than 5% of what should have been done was done. But people didn't get that this is the biggest single threat that you know, could disrupt our way of life, uh, which you know, even having predicted that as a risk, I'm really stunned at how you know, tough it is to go through this. Uh, you know, the medical costs, the economic costs, the psychological costs, you know, everybody's 
lives have been completely upended. Uh, and, and that's not just the United States. It's, it's almost the entire world. Well, let me ask you personally about that. Bill and Melinda Gates, I think it's fair to say, are not your typical American family. But how has this virus, this epidemic, how has it upended your life? And how personally are you dealing with and processing what we're going through now? Well, I'm, you know, a lot more isolated. Uh, the meetings are on uh, software, uh, Microsoft Teams. Uh, you know, I, I even friends uh, that I would normally uh, go see. You know, we're doing video conferencing, which seems a bit unusual. Uh, you know, there's a lot of anxiety uh, about, you know, how far uh, does this go? Uh, we have employees of the foundation. <clears throat> who feel a bit isolated, you know, because they're just in their apartment. Some with their kids there feel like uh, it's very crowded. So how do we help people deal with this? Uh, you know, they, a lot of people are rising to the occasion. Uh, but, you know, I, I, for me, it, you know, my life is just completely different. I wake up every morning and think, is this real or was it something I had a nightmare about? And like all the rest of us, I mean, do you get scared sometimes? And if so, about what? Well, this isn't the worst case. That is the 1% or so case fatality rate uh, when your medical system is not overloaded. If this was smallpox, that would be like 30%. So this is super, super bad. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we will eventually get a vaccine. Even before then, if we do the right things, we'll be able to open up uh, significant parts of the economy. And, you know, so once you're, you're in the crisis, you're just doing your best uh, to deal with it. I'm sure, you know, once we get past this, we'll look back, understand what we could have done differently and make sure uh, that we're not letting it happen again, particularly because it could be even worse uh, in terms of the fatality rate. Bill Gates, next time you give one of these speeches, I hope, I trust people will listen. Thank you so much. Thank you.